Welcome everyone. I'm joined here by Arthur Brightman of the Tezos Project. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So one of the things that Tezos is renowned for is the ability to make changes on chain. And this week has been a pretty historic moment for you guys. You made your first on chain change. This was activated and uh, this was as a result of three months of stakeholders voting. So tell me about this, what the change was and, and how it all worked. Yeah, so I think the change itself is fairly minor. I think the bigger news is probably around the voting process and the fact that for the first time, there was an on-chain upgrade that was uh, pushed automatically uh, to know that that just never happened before. Um, and you know, the, so the upgrade itself does two things. One is that it raises the gas limit per block. So it essentially tells you that you can do more computation, you can run more complex smart contracts, um, you can do more things in, uh, in one block. And the main reason for that is that when the network launched, you know, it was very new. And the limit was set at a pretty conservative value. And the idea is that you have on-chain governance so you can progressively loosen that value until you know, you're, you're confident that, you know, the, that the, the different nodes on the network are capable of handling this, uh, this level of transaction. So you know, rather than trying to say like, oh, we have that much TPS or that much thing, you, know, you, you, you want to start from a safe position and then you know, progressively, uh, progressively get there. And the second thing is um, there's a reduction in the role size. So the role size is a bit of a it's a bit of a technical thing. So there's you know this is a staking uh, it's a proof of stake system, uh, and in proof of stake you have you know the concept of staking funds you know how much is at stake, and for efficiency purposes it's, and it's really for efficiency purposes, the stake in this is rounded down, or was rounded down to the nearest ten thousand. And so sometimes people confuse that and say like, oh, you need a minimum of 10,000. It's not about having a threshold or a minimum. It's not about like, oh, you have a 10,000. You're not going to, no, no. It's, it's, it's rounded down. So if you have like 9,000, that doesn't count. If you have 11,000, that counts as 10,000. If you have 21,000, that counts as 20,000 and so on and so forth. And so again, that's for efficiency purposes. That's a conservative value. And that number was changed to 8,000. Now it's it's a little bit of a bigger deal than the um, than the shift in gas because this one is not just changing a constant. You're not just going to change a constant in a file. You actually have to change the way the data is represented uh, on the fly. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot more complexity in that change than uh, uh, than you might uh, think on the surface. So those were the two changes, fairly minor changes. But I think the big news is that uh, you know is this voting process that took place over three months. Yeah, and it was tremendously successful. A lot of tokens, uh, or token holders, I should say, turned out for this. It's weighted by the number of tokens that vote. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, you know, token weighting of votes, if you're going to do any type of vote on, on, on a blockchain, it's pretty much your only option if you want to be a permissionless blockchain. So, you know, if you want to be completely decentralized and permissionless, you're not going to have a concept of individual identity because that's not really civil resistance. So, you know, the only thing that you can count uh, on a blockchain are, well, you could count CPU, like ASIC power, you could proof of work. Uh, you could count stake uh, with proof of stake, or you could count like stake-based voting, or you could count, you know, there's other things like proof of space, but basically you're limited. You can't really do proof of human in a trustless manner. So talk me through how the change is actually implemented. All of the nodes upgraded simultaneously. How does that rollout happen? Yeah, so basically the way the system works is that you tell the chain, first, um, there's an injection. So you tell the chain, hey, I have an idea for a change, an amendment. And here's the hash of the source code of that amendment. So, you know, when you make a proposal, you're not just like proposing an idea. You know, it's a concrete implementation. You're proposing a piece of code. You're saying this is exactly you know the piece of code that I propose we uh, we change. So you make that proposal, and then people can go in the proposal, and in the first phase, uh, in the first phase lasts about three weeks. Uh, people can decide to upvote the ones you like. You know, like. I like this one. I like this one. I like this one. You can like several, but then one is going to have more of than any other. And in the second phase, which is also three weeks, um, people can decide to vote uh, yes no or pass for that proposal. And there, uh, in this case, there, the, there was a quorum requirement of 80%. 80% of, of, of the coins had to express an opinion for this to pass. And of those who express an opinion, 80% needed to say yes. So it's a very, it's a pretty strict criterion. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not like oh, a 51%, it. which is how a lot of changes happen in, in other chains. Yeah, and so you could say, well, you know, what if you had 51%, you know, if you have 51%, you could 51% attack the chain anyway, and you could have your way. So, you know, what's the point of having 80%? And the point of having 80% is that there's a very big difference between deciding that you're somehow going to attack the system and deciding that, you know, uh, you're just going to accept the, the, the outcome of a vote. So it's not, you know, uh, a lot of people are, most people I would say who use the system are completely fine with being bound by the result of the vote. You know, that's what you accept when you get into the system. Right. And let's talk about the different ways that changes are implemented across different chains. So one of the reasons when I've spoken to you in the past, you talked about you know, getting involved with Tezos is you saw a lot of new tech being developed and you saw that it just wasn't being implemented into Bitcoin. And that's frustrating. You know, how do you implement something when the way to implement it is with a hard fork and, and it kind of gets very messy. And so it kind of started that what Tezos does is explores a way to do this without hard forking a project so talk to me about the benefits of making these changes on chain and how it may be better than other uh, other methods that other chains use right so i think that I, I i i think the benefit of doing it on chain is is protecting um is protecting the values of the system so if you look at bitcoin i think one of the things that uh people who talk about bitcoin and, and bitcoin governance get right is that if you're going to have changes in your system, that can be a weak point. You know, if your system is open to changes, uh, people can use political, social pressure, uh, any kind of pressure can be exerted in order to say like, ha, huh, you know what, there's a way to change this. Uh, you know, if there's a way to change the rules of the ledger of the blockchain, I can, you know, I can put pressure and I can, and I can get bad stuff uh, in. And you want to be able to protect yourself against that. And I think the strategy that's been uh, chosen by Bitcoin is to say, well, we're going to have very, very strong cultural norms around never changing. We're not going to change anything. Or if, if their changes are going to be so minimal and so uncontroversial, and they're going to go for so long that we're going to protect ourselves against any... Uh, and if there are any larger yeah. changes, then that necessitates a hard fork. And so that can get problematic. Yeah, and so basically, I think it works in terms of like protecting yourself, and it has worked for, for for Bitcoin. The problem is that then you also give up on the ability of having more meaningful uh, technological changes, like you know using pri uh, privacy protecting transactions, for example. I think are very important or smart contracts. And what I've seen too often is people in the Bitcoin space basically have you know uh, sour grapes. And said like, oh, but you know, smart contracts are useless anyway. You know, it's, like, it's not that it's not that my cultural norms means that I can never have those. It's just that it turns out that all of the things that weren't part of the original Bitcoin client were useless anyway, and so we don't need them, and that's great. Right. Um, and I think that's too bad. So how do you get a system that really protects yourself against external interference, like something that you cannot corrupt easily? but can still have some flexibility for having innovation. And, and that's what Tezos tries to do. And that's why you have you know, this three months voting period and 80% supermajority. It is pretty stringent. What are the benefits of making these changes on chain rather than doing things in like a second layer, for example? Well, you know, why can't you just hard fork and say like, yay, you know, let's just hard fork all the time. We'll propose something. And the next thing is that that, that can be captured. You know, that, that process is not stringent enough. And I think it can be... Uh, uh, it can be abused. So why not layer two solution? If something can be done at layer two, by all means, it should be done at layer two. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, but not everything can be done at layer two. Uh, and, you know, one of this idea was that layer two is side chains, you know. Uh, Bitcoin side chains used to be a thing in 2014 and then somehow, uh, 2015, and then somehow the whole thing went nowhere. And that's very disappointing because you can have a lot of innovation, you can have a lot of features in those side chains. So layer two is difficult because in, um, in the blockchain, essentially the chain itself is a source of truth. And so you have to play a lot of games in order to uh, make sure that nothing, uh, and nothing bad happens on the side chain, that you can go back on the chain and, and, and verify everything. And so you can do these things, but it's a, little, uh, it's a little tricky. I would say the closest things to those approaches are 
uh, what some of the sharding systems are trying to, to develop, or things like commit chains. Uh, you know, there's Marigold and Tezos Plasma on, on Ethereum. So those are very interesting. But you know, these are not going to get you a lot of the uh, features that you might want. You know, they're not going to increase um, they're not going to improve the consensus algorithm of your base layer, for example. So Blockstream recently launched Liquid. So that is sort of a layer two solution. Do you, like, are you hopeful about what that could bring? Well, I mean, Liquid is a permission chain, which is fine. Uh, it has its uses, but, you know, I think it's fine for applications which don't really need censorship resistance. You know, it's just a private blockchain. And it's cool, but it's, it's, it's not exactly new. Right. I think that it's, I, I don't know too much about it. I think they did some cool thing with functionaries. It was like hardware systems which are distributed that kind of like um, find this chain. And I understand, I think that their, their target market are exchanges. And I think that might make sense for them to, to use that. But as a, as, as a big platform for a lot of permissionless innovation, I don't necessarily think it's going to be that great. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't think you can do really smart contracts. There's a lot of features that you might expect from a, uh, from a modern chain that are not really present. So let's talk about hard forks. Is it possible to hard fork Tezos? Because I've heard some people say that, you know, with this system, it's actually not possible to do this. Yeah, so that, 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 that's, that's a big misconception I think that people have. So the idea is that you don't need to hard fork Tezos. If you have a change, if somehow, you know, you disagree with the technical direction of the project, if you think that, when, you know, if you think that it would be so great that if we had uh, privacy tr preserving transaction, any kind of changes that you might want to see in Tezos, you can do that with a consensus algorithm, I'm sorry, with a, with a guardian system. You know, it's very, very flexible. So you can enact almost any changes so long as you're capable of convincing every, a, a large fraction of the platform that this is worth doing. And so it doesn't mean that you can hard for it because you know the, the, the source code is MIT. And so you know if you want to uh, if you want to launch a fork of Tezos, it's basically you know it's, it's, it's basically a five minute process of you know uh, taking the source code, copy pasting, and launching one. But the very big difference with other systems is that in other systems there's ambiguity. If there's a hard fork, for example, of Bitcoin or Ethereum, there's going to be always some uh, can, there's going to be a pretext. There's going to be contentious pretext. You know, so Ethereum Classic is like, well, we really disagree with the DAO, uh, with this DAO thing, and so therefore we're going to go uh, 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 preserve the original uh, version of Ethereum, whatever. Uh, if you have Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin, uh, you know, one is going to say like, no, 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 we want to keep the block small, and the network is centralized, and and you know the fees high to subsidize the blocks, and the other side might say, no, you know, we need to have many on-chain transactions, we need to have bigger blocks, and so on and so forth. So there's generally like going to be a disagreement that's going to motivate this thing, but all of these disagreements can be resolved if you use on-chain governance for your system, and so. If you decide to completely issue that, if you just say like, no, you know what? Even though I could present my change with on-chain governance, I'm just going to do my own fork. Yeah. Uh, you're, ba you're basically saying that you, you, you know you don't have people's confidence. So the, your motives when you do that become very transparent. Right. I have less than less than twenty percent of people agree with me. I mean, is, it is possible that the voting process could be captured because when you're trying to promote your vision and say convince people that your change is something that would be good for the network, etc. There's a tremendous amount of work that is required for that, right? And uh, yeah. sometimes the like the correct thing isn't always successful. Sometimes people just don't want change for whatever reason. So, do you are you fearful that this process could be captured in some way that if you get eighty percent of of tokens then you will be able to implement a change that could potentially be harmful for the network yeah so um there's a balance between trying to be a little too loose and not protect yourself against uh social engineering and this type of thing and a, and a balance between being too strict and basically have uh too many actors who can just basically uh like video saying major say like no i'm not voting for this and so it's hard to strike the balance. It, it, I, would, I think it's better, at least early on, to err on the side of Bitcoin, which is to say, let's be very conservative about, any, you know, about the changes that happen. It's better to err on that side because it's a side that's been proven, mm -hmm. as opposed to err on the side of like, you know, let's just have 
uh, let, let, let's just be very, very loose in the acceptance criterion. But that can be changed. So, you know, there are proposals uh, that people have made to start to actually lower the, uh, the requirements in, uh, in the future. To say like, no, this is too conservative. I think we will be more nimble if we can have slightly lower requirements. So that's interesting. But, but if you move to lower requirements, at least you inherit the conservatism because you'd like, no, you know what? There were, there were many, many people who thought that it was okay to, uh, to have lower requirements. So in some sense, you want to start from something conservative and then you kind of inherit its properties so long as the decisions being made are somewhat rational, you inherit the, the, the strictness. But anyway, that's, that's how right. I see it. Right. What kind of changes do you see being useful in the Tezos system? Oh, okay. So that, that's interesting. Um, I would like to improve the consensus algorithm. Uh, it's okay, uh, but it's, it's from 2013 and there's been a lot of research and proof of stake over the past five years. So uh, bringing up to speed so that we can uh, get some uh, faster finality. And, and, and the word finality is used now as, I think it's always probabilistic regardless of the algorithm that you use. So I, I, I like to think in terms of time, you know, do you have to wait 200 blocks in order to be convinced that this thing is not going to be reverted or do you have to wait one block or do you have to wait a few blocks? So um, that's what I call faster finality. I think that would be very helpful. Um, and there are some, um, and, and, and there are some efforts to uh, take some inspirations from Dendermint, for example, but with some random sampling in order to get this type of uh, features on the chain. Uh, I would like to see integration of uh, the sampling circuit from Zcash. I think that privacy preserving, uh, I mean, you know, the existence of Zcash and the fact that, you know, Bitcoin didn't really, uh, a lot of Bitcoin developers didn't really want it in Bitcoin is one of the reasons I'm, I'm so interested in Tezos is that you should be able to do this. So uh, privacy preserving transaction offered inside smart contracts uh, strike me as, uh, as very important. Uh, and I would say like those are the big, uh, the big picture item and there's a lot of small picture item which make a ton of difference in practice, but are not as, uh, you know, are not as headline worthy. Uh, so for example, uh, having multiple entry points inside smart contracts, uh, for example, cleaning up the account system, uh, improving a little bit the on-chain randomness. So uh, I had a blog post uh, uh, a while back, go, I forgot what it's called, I think it's improvements I like to see Tezos or something like this, and it's pretty much still up to date, uh, except that now a lot of these things have actually been, uh, been implemented. So uh, okay. hopefully, uh, Hopefully, yeah. Ho hopefully, committees convinced that these these are worthwhile changes and uh, and they get enacted. On the, on the I chain. really like what you're talking about. How you have things from 2013 and you recognise that there have been updates since then. You don't hear that a lot in the space. I think there tend to be some interesting uh, crypto luddites out there. It's like a strange contradiction out there where we have this cutting edge tech and then it gets to a certain point and people say, okay, no more. No more innovation after this. We keep it as is. And, uh, and I think that we do need to recognize that things move really fast in this space and keeping up with all of the, the latest tech in terms of privacy, in terms of security, I think it's really important. So I do appreciate that Tezos has the ability to uh, integrate some of these a lot more easily than other chains do. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's a big strength. If you have if you are if there's a lot of innovation happening, a lot of technical development, you want to have you want to have this flexibility. And maybe in ten years, maybe in ten years, you know, the whole field is settled. You know, everything has been discovered in this field essentially, and uh, and you have no on-chain governance anymore. Or maybe you have on-chain governance, but it's like it happens every year. It's a year-long process, and you need a ninety percent vote or something like that. So I think over time you become even more conservative in the changes that you want to make to the system. Right. Because you don't, you don't need it as much. Yeah, and you do seem to walk that fine line between wanting to integrate new technology and also not wanting to move too fast and break things. You know, you're dealing with currency, you're dealing with uh, you know, something that has a lot of value that could disappear completely if someone screws up. So making sure that things are moving slow enough so that important bugs are caught and uh, that all the right decisions are being made, I think is, is really smart. So you guys do seem to walk that line uh, pretty well. Yeah, I think that's part of the ethos of the, uh, of the community, and that's uh, and, that, and it's great to see this, uh, this alignment. You guys are experimenting with things that other chains just aren't going near. So this is all very new stuff that's being tried out there. So you must feel pretty good that this uh, on-chain upgrade has turned out so successfully. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm very glad that uh, that the update was uh, was very su successful, and I think that you know. 
uh, a lot of that is owed to the fact that there's a very active community in Tezos, and you know, the, 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 I, I I watch it happen at 3 a.m. and, uh, and uh, I was in the you know there's a Slack channel for bakers in Tezos, and on the baking Slack there were all the bakers who were watching their node and seeing it happen, and so that I think that ensured a, uh, a pretty smooth transition. That's pretty exciting. So what's next for Tezos? Are there any upcoming changes that are being voted on that you can see on the horizon? So there has not been any uh, new proposal yet. Uh, there's this French company, Nomadic Labs, uh, who uh, announced yesterday that they were going to, uh, they're building a proposal and it's, it's not just a proposal, they're doing it in collaboration with other people. So there's open source contributors, um, there's a variable project, a script job. So there's a bunch of, of people who have contributed, you know, little and bigger changes to the code base. And so they intend on uh, making uh, several proposals coming uh, at the end of June. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on everything that's going on. It's really exciting to see Tezos doing so well. And I really appreciate your time chatting with me here today. Thank you so much. Thank you.